Hello, everybody. I'm a small group today, but hopefully it's going to be interesting nevertheless. Um, in today's lecture, we will cover a fairly large class of signaling molecules, which um, deviate a little bit from the traditional, from the tradition that we covered in most of the of this course, where most of the signaling molecules were derived from one group of chemicals. Amino acids. So almost all the signaling molecules that we covered so far have been derived in one way or another from amino acids. All catecholamines, monoamines, uh, peptides, all these things are derived from amino acids. Today we will cover mediators which are derived from fatty acids. So quite a big difference chemically and metabolically as well and we will in the beginning do a little bit of revision of the nomenclature of fatty acids and the, the synthesis of especially polyunsaturated fatty acids. But before we get to the actual topic of this lecture, let me just say that in addition to the mediators of inflammation, which is going to be the topic of today's lecture, and a little bit of pharmacology at the end, just to show you how the knowledge of those metabolic pathways is relevant for clinical medicine, but before, before we get to these mediators of inflammation, let me just say that there is another class of, another group of mediators of signaling molecules which are also derived from fatty acids. We only mention them very, very briefly, not in a huge amount of detail, uh, but they are endocannabinoids. So molecules which bind to cannabinoid receptors, to the same receptors as delta-9 THC, which is in cannabis which obviously is not why we have those receptors. We have those receptors in the brain because they bind endocannabinoids. And these endocannabinoids are also derivatives of fatty acids. Uh, I will not cover them today, but just to give you a perspective that we have at least two groups of signal mo signaling molecules derived from fatty acids. One are endocannabinoids, and the other one is the group that we will talk about, is the class we're going to talk about today, which are called eicosanoids. So eicosanoids is a fairly large group of molecules. We will, today we'll cover them in quite some detail, but we will not cover each member of this group because there are literally, well, many tens, if not small hundreds of them. Um, so we'll not cover each individu individual molecule. Um, what connects all these eicosanoids together is, first of all, they're derived from fatty acids, and second of all, which is, in the name, and I'm not sure we have any Greek speakers here. Uh, yeah, okay, so it comes from the word for? For 20. <laughs> for 20, correct. <laughs> okay, and why they're called eicosanoids? Because they contain 20 carbon atoms. Um, some of them are modified in various ways, so they may contain fewer or more, but the basic structure contains 20 carbon atoms, hence the name. Uh, but as we'll see, there are many different subclasses, uh, uh, subclasses of it. <laughs> now, before we get to eicosanoids specifically and how they are synthesized, I said in the beginning that they serve as mediators of inflammation. Now, you've heard about what inflammation is and how we can recognize it, how we can detect it clinically. So what is inflammation and how can we tell that there is inflammation in a patient? Yeah, that's that's a well. Let's let's first talk about what inflammation is. Okay, so inflammation is a reaction of organism to some kind of damage. That's pretty good, pretty general, but pretty good uh, definition because yeah, there are, there are many different types of reactions which which come un, under this umbrella of inflammation. So yeah, it is a response of the organism to some kind of damage, tissue damage, cellular damage, or something like that. And what are the signs of inflammation? Okay, so first we can have a look at local inflammation. So local inflammatory reaction, and there we see those classical, already known from ancient times, those classical signs of inflammation, which are redness, swelling, swelling pain, pain. Itching. itching. Yeah, okay, not one of the classical signs, but there can be itching, absolutely. But local, uh, local. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, increase in temperature, increase in temperature, absolutely. And the fifth one, not the classical one. Mm, that's only a subset. Yeah, loss of function. Okay, so those are the, the four classical ones plus one loss of loss of function. So those are the signs where you can tell uh, a local inflammation, like on the skin or something like that. Of course, there are the the range of inflammatory reactions is much broader than than these classical signs, especially in situations where we have systemic inflammation. So it's not an inflammation which is lo localized to a small area where there was damage, but actually is in the whole body. And we will cover those, or you will cover those in later years uh, in more detail. But these systemic inflammations generally do not tend to have all these signs, or sometimes they might not have any of those signs, of those classical signs of inflammation, but they are still very important uh, types of inflammatory reactions. And for clinical medicine, many of these systemic inflammations are even more important for treatment and for diagnosis uh, than localized inflammation that you all probably know even from your own experience. So this inflammatory reaction or these inflammatory rea reactions require or use a lot of different signaling molecules. And you've heard many of them, so we'll, we'll talk about eicosanoids, so let's leave those aside. But apart from eicosanoids, what other signaling molecules are important for inflammation? Interleukins. interleukins. Histamine, okay, so we have interleukins, many of those. There's histamine as a small molecule, so interleukins are peptides, yeah. Histamine is a small molecule, and we covered it in the neuro block, but it is, of course, important for signaling and inflammation, and is actually responsible for a lot of these localized signs, yeah, swelling, redness, all these things are at least in part mediated by histamine. TNF, TNF yeah, absolutely, to a necrosis factor. Leukotrienes, those are eicosanoids, so we'll cover them today. But yes, absolutely, they are some mediators of, uh, they are important mediators of inflammation. Any other that we haven't covered? And of course, interleukins, there are so many of them that there are, yeah. Chemokines, Chemokines yeah, the whole, yeah, the whole big group of cytokines, which will, which will include all these subgroups as well. So loads of different mediators. As we'll see today, some of these mediators, their, their final effects are still mediated by eicosanoids. So some of the interleukins and other cytokines might be actually doing, might be causing their effects through the formation of eicosanoids, as we'll see in a second. Um, but yeah, so loads of different mediators, but today we will specifically cover eicosanoids and how we can interfere with eicosanoid signaling in order to decrease inflammation, treat inflammation. So that's gonna be at the end of the lecture. Right, so we said that eicosanoids have 20 carbons, at least the, the basic structure has 20 carbons, and they are derived from fatty acids. And I mentioned it, but I'll say it again, that those fatty acids which serve as the, um, as the substrate for the, as the initial substrate for the synthesis of eicosanoids are polyunsaturated fatty acids. So, do you know any polyunsaturated fatty acid that has 20 carbons? Arachidonic acid, absolutely. And arachidonic acid, is the main substrate, is the main starting substrate um, for the synthesis of eicosanoids in our cells. It's not the only one, we'll see other ones as well, okay? It's not the only one. Right, so arachidonic acid, what kind of acid is that? So can we describe it more systematically so that we can know what kind of acid it is? So it is, okay, so it has 20 carbons, we said that in the beginning. So 20 carbons, it has four double bonds. So the systematic name is Ecosa tetraenoic acid. Ecosa tetraenoic. Does, does it make sense how it works systematically? Yeah, Ecosa tetraenoic acid. But knowing that there are 20 carbons and four double bonds is not enough to describe the specific molecule because of course the double bonds can be arranged in any way. So first we can describe it perfectly systematically. So we can, we can name the carbon atoms where the double bond is. So 5, 8, 11, 14. 5, 8, 11, 14. I have to trust you. I don't, I don't remember that, um, but I think it's probably right. Uh, do we have it somewhere? Yeah, that's probably right. 
Um, so that's, this would be the, the systematic way of describing where the double bonds are, just naming the carbons. And of course, as we are taking the letters of the carbons, we are starting from the carboxyl. So the carboxyl carbon is number one, right? So this would be absolutely the correct way of describing it. But generally, when we talk about polyunsaturated fatty acids, we use a much, much more simplified way of describing them. And actually, we only need one more information, one more, one, num one more number, basically, to be able to describe the whole molecule. So we have 20 carbons, four double ones, and the third thing that we need to know is, is the location of the first double bond from the opposite end. So not by the carboxyl, but the other end. Now, the more modern nomenclature and the one which is recommended is now using N notation instead of omega. It's the same thing, okay? So we'll, we'll get to that, okay? I'll, I'll, show, I'll show that in a second. But why is it that just knowing the number of carbons, the number of, du number of double bonds, and the location of the first of them, or last of them, depend depending on which, which way you're looking at the, uh, at the molecule. Why is that enough to say, okay, we know everything about the molecule. We know where all the other double bonds are. Correct. In fatty acids, in polyunsaturated fatty acids that we have in our body, the arrangement, or especially that are synthesized in our body, the arrangement of double bonds is always such that there's a double bond, CH2, double bond, CH2, double bond. So we always know that between two double bonds, there's exactly one carbon between them, one spacer. Okay? So knowing just one of them, we can basically calculate all the other ones because we know that there's just one CH2 between them. And that's the reason why we don't necessarily have to use this notation, we can just use this notation to tell us, okay, this is the first double bond and all the other ones follow the same pattern. But we could use the upper notation as well, but just by saying the, the five one, therefore we could do the same. If we know there's only four double bonds, just by knowing we have one in five, we can also know that we have one in eight. Yes, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you could do that, it's just not the way it's done, okay? And there's a good reason why we use this N notation rather than this one. We'll see in a second why there is, okay, that, that there is actually a pretty good reason for that. Um, all right, so if we use the omega or the n notation, uh, what would be the omega number or the n number for our ketonic acid? Yeah, it's so omega 6 or n6, okay, it's, again, it's the, it's the same thing, which basically tells us that the first double bond is on the sixth carbon from the opposite end from the, uh, from the carboxyl. Um, the last thing we know about basically all the fatty acids that are synthesized in our body is the, the isomerism, the type of the double bond, which is always which is always cis. Okay? So in, in fatty acids which are synthesized in our body, there's always cis double bond. So that we know, generally speaking, we know about fatty acids. Therefore, just knowing these three, three numbers, we can say, okay, we know the whole molecule. Now, having said that, in our body, of course, we find other types of fatty acids. We find trans fatty acids, trans unsaturated fatty acids, which we get from the diet, especially from dairy products because the, the bacteria in the intestines or in the stomachs of cows, of dairy, uh, dairy animals, they produce trans fatty acids. So actually milk, just normal natural milk, contains relatively high percentage of trans fatty acids. Okay? So it's not something that's completely unusual or that is only synthetic or something like that. No, in nature, we do find trans fatty acids actually qu quite a lot. We also find fatty acids that have differently arranged uh, or differently spaced double bonds. So that do exist in nature that exist, for example, conjugated fatty acids. So the double bonds in a fatty acid can be also conjugated, okay? So not spaced by one CH2. So there are many other possible fatty acids. So this simplified description is really simplified just for the purpose of saying, okay, these are the mostly occurring polyunsaturated fatty acids. Just be aware, if you need to get any of the more ex to, to any of the more exotic ones, you actually have to use the, the complete s systematic description, just to be aware. All right. Now, 
I said that there is a good reason for using the omega notation rather than the, the five notation. And that is that this omega or n notation, and we should really be using the n notation because that's the correct one, um, it tells us something important about those fatty acids. What is it? Correct. It tells us whether they're going to be essential or whether we can synthesize them in our body. How does that work? So which ones are essential and which ones are not? Or which ones we can synthesize and which ones we can't synthesize and why is that? Less than seven. So any fatty acid, which would be omega-7 and less, or N7 and less, we can't synthesize in our body. That's absolutely correct. Why is that? We can't put the double bond so close to the end. Correct. So the way we produce unsaturated fatty acids in our body is that first we make a complete saturated fatty acid, and you know the synthetic pathway, okay, by building, by using these two carbon bits, okay, and just putting them next to each other. And then once we have the saturated fatty acid, we start introducing double bonds into it by means of enzymes which are, which are called desaturases. Okay, so desaturase is an enzyme which puts a double bond into fatty acid, basically into a fatty acid chain, okay? In our cells, we only have a limited range of desaturases, okay? So plants, for example, will have a really many, many different desaturases, so they can produce many different polyunsaturated fatty acids. In our body, I think we have four, yes, we have four desaturases, which are delta-4, delta-5, delta-6, and delta-9. You don't necessarily have to remember all of them, but the important thing is that the desaturase, which can put the double bond the farthest away from the carboxyl, therefore the closest to the other end, to the non-carboxyl end, is the delta-9 desaturase. So, the shortest fatty acid that we normally synthesize in our body and that can be acted on by desaturases is no, or like it's not a saturated fatty acid and it's definitely not the shortest one. No, 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 it's, those are unsaturated fatty acids. The normal saturated one is? It's palmitic, okay? So palmitic acid is kind of the, the shortest normal product of the synthesis of fatty acids in, in our body, okay? which then can be elongated to steric acid and longer acids, okay? So if we use palmitic acid, how many carbons are in palmitic acid? 16. So palmitic acid is a 16 completely saturated, 16 carbon completely saturated chain. Now, if we use the delta-9 desaturase on palmitic acid, what kind of acid are we gonna get? I mean, I'm not going I'm not asking you about the name. Maybe you know the name. Oleic. It's not going to be oleic acid. Oleic acid would be derived from steric acid. It's called palmito oleic acid. Oh, palmito oleic acid. That's perfectly fine. And it's going to be, so it has one double bond. And so it would be 16, 1. And it's going to be omega seven. omega 7. Or N7 to use the... the more modern, correct nomenclature. Can everybody figure this out? Can you, can you see how this works? Yeah? So we have 16 carbons in total. We have delta-9 desaturase, so we count nine carbons from the carboxyl, put a double bond there. So from the other side, the double bond is going to be on the seventh carbon from the other end. Does that make sense? Or do you have to draw it? I think you probably can figure that out, all right? So this is kind of the lowest omega number or N number that we can get because we can't really have those, de those desaturases act on shorter fatty acids. It's not gonna work. Their substrate specificity is such that it's, they're not gonna work with shorter acids than, than palmitic acid. And all the available desaturases basically are even shorter than nine. So nine is the furthest we can get and the shortest distance from the end carbon. After that, once we make this acid, we can elongate it. So we have another class of enzymes called elongases. 
And elongase is basically just add another two carbons to the fatty acid, the same way as it works in the synthesis of fatty acids. Okay? So we just take another malonyl CoA and add it and add two carbons, two carbons, and two carbons. So we can elongate them as long as we wish. But after the elongation, we can't put the double bond anywhere closer to the other end, right? Because we're, we're elongating the, uh, the fatty acid from the, from the carboxyl end, so we can make it as long as we want. So it's the, the delta numbers are going to change, but the omega number is not going to change because we are elongating from the other side. Does it make sense why we can't make in our body anything lower than N7? Good. So that means that N6, of course, N5, N4, but we don't find them very often. They do exist, but we, we don't find them very often. N3, uh, unsaturated fatty acids, are considered as as not possible to be synthesized in our body, and especially N6 and N3 are considered essential because they are important for many functions in our body. One of them, an important one of them, being the synthesis of eicosanoids. So, uh, arachidonic acid is, as I said, the prototypical polyunsaturated fatty acid, it's an N6 fatty acid, which is used for the synthesis of many of the eicosanoids, but it is not the only one which we find in our body. Um, I will mention some of the other ones, which, so we have to get them from the, from the diet, right? That we can't synthesize them. I will mention some of the other ones as well. However, arachidonic acid, even though it's essential, it can be synthesized from other N6 acids. So we can't make a new N6 acid or omega-6, but we can use some other N6 acid from the diet to get to arachidonic acid. And in fact, in our diet, the amount of arachidonic acid is tiny. Okay? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, do you know where the name comes from? It comes from peanuts, uh, which for Czech students is very easy to see because uh, yeah, it's, we have the, the word for peanuts is, is very close to this. Um, I understand that in other languages this, this doesn't work, but it comes from peanuts. And it's actually, it is present in peanuts and other types of plant oils, but in very small quantities. So this is actually not the way we get most of our, mo most of our N6 acids from the diet is through getting arachidonic acid. There's very tiny amounts. We actually get mostly in the diet a completely different fatty acid, which is also N6, and we can then use it to synthesize arachidonic acid. And this is what happens in our cells. Now, what is this N6 acid, which is pretty dominant in, as a polyunsaturated acid, in, especially in plant oils and in, in our diet? Linoleic. Correct. It's linoleic acid. So linoleic acid is in very high content in many different plant oils and fats and whatever, okay, and nuts and elsewhere. So we do get it, we do get a lot of it in the diet. And linoleic, linoleic acid, using the structure that we had before, is, is what? Correct. So 18 carbons two double bonds, and we already said that it has to be N6 because we can't change that, right? So it has to be an N6 acid. So this is linoleic acid. Now, we want to get all the way to arachidonic acid, which is 24 N6. So what kind of reactions we have to do or what kind of enzymes have to act on it? So we need at least, I mean, we need exactly one elongation because we need to get from 18 to 20. That's two carbons, one elongation. And we need desaturate, desaturate steps, but how many of those? We need two desaturate steps, desaturation steps, yeah. Um, so that's, exac that's exactly what happens. So with the linoleic acid in the diet, the first step is the first desaturation. Um, so what we get is an acid that has three double bonds. It's still N6. We can't change that in any way, so it's always going to be N6. And it has three double bonds. So the f it's desaturation, and we get this. Now, what is this acid? It is called gamma-linolenic acid. It's called gamma-linolenic acid. 
And why am I emphasizing this gamma linolenic? Because there is, there is also an alpha linolenic acid. Now, this is not a good nomenclature, okay? In organic nomenclature, this doesn't make any sense, this gamma and alpha. This is for historical reasons where they basically uh, isolated some fatty acids and they looked the same. They were isomers, right? So they called one alpha and the other one gamma. I don't know what, if there were other ones. So this is not a good nomenclature, but that's how we are left with it. So it is, it is an isomer, so it is also 18,3. There's three double bonds and 18 carbons, but, gum, uh, but alpha linolenic acid is correct, is M3. So it is actually in a completely different branch of synthesis. We can't interchange those two, okay, because we can't move the, the double bonds around, okay. So this is actually in the M3 branch of synthesis, and we'll see some other acids in the M3 uh, branch. But the names look the same, that were almost the same. So this is gamma linolenic, which is N6, and alpha linolenic, which is N3. It's not related to the synthesis in any way. We can also find both of these, both, both of these acids can be found in the diet in various plant oils. Okay? And maybe, yeah, both of them you might see in like cosmetic products and stuff like that. And they may say, oh, there's a lot of gamma linolenic or alpha linolenic acid or whatever. Um, yeah. Whether well, I, I will mention I will talk a little bit about whether they do anything interesting or not. I mean, when we supplement them. All right. So there was one desaturation step to make gamma linolenic acid, and the next step is elongation. So we elongated. We add two carbons to it, and what we get is an acid which is kind of semi-systematically called dihomo. Gamma, gamma linolenic. And you might remember this, this nomenclature step, this homo from homovanillic acid, for example. It means that we just added two carbons to it. Okay? So this is commonly used in organic nomenclature. When we add two carbons or two CH2 groups, we call it homo something. Okay? Or homocysteine, for example. You know, homocysteine. Yeah? So that's like cysteine. Yeah. Hmm? But why the dye? Sorry? Why the prefix dye? Yeah, because it's, so homo means just one CH2. Oh. Okay, dihomo means two CH2 groups. Okay, yeah, maybe I misspoke, but that's how it works. So in the elongation step, we get dihomo gamma linolenic acid, whose structure is, again with the numbers, is 20, 3, and 6. Yep, yeah? 20, 3, and 6. I would just point out, we already have a fatty acid with 20 carbons, so dihamogamma linolenic acid also can be a precursor to eicosanoids. And I will mention it again later on, because we have different kind of groups of eicosanoids. One group can be synthesized directly from dihamogamma linolenic acid. Good. The last step is going to be another desaturation, and we're going to get Arachidonic acid. So these are the steps that most of our arachidonic acid in our cells that we have is synthesized. We don't get it from the diet. We get some of the other gamma linolenic or linoleic acid uh, in the diet, and then it gets converted to arachidonic acid. Okay. Now the final bit before we get to the actual synthesis of eicosanoids is where is this arachidonic acid? So we have it in our cells, but where is it? Where, where in a cell can we find it? Smooth endoplasmic reticulum? Well, sort of. We find them in the membrane, and this is important. So the arachidonic acid and all these polyunsaturated fatty acids are not stored in some vesicles or other structures that would be just storing them. They are actually in membrane. So it could be endoplasmic reticulum membrane, or it could be cytoplasmic membrane, or it could be mitochondrial membrane, but it's mostly membranes, or it's almost entirely membranes, that contain these polyunsaturated fatty acids. We don't find them anywhere else. So in order 
to use our ketonic acid for the synthesis of eicosanoids or for other purposes, we first have to release it from the membrane. And for that, we need enzymes. So in the membrane, what, what is the form that these polyunsaturated fatty acids are going to be in? What are the chemicals? Well, they are esterified, yes. They are bound to ester bonds in, in, in phospholipids. Okay, so they're in phospholipids. And we need to liberate them from, we need to hydrolyze them from the phospholipids in order to be used in the synthesis. So for that, we need enzymes called liprase. Correct, we need phospholipases. Okay, and you've heard about some phospholipases before. So if we take a very schematic structure of a phospholipid, I'm leaving out some hydrogens and stuff like that, just to make it a little bit easier. Okay, so that's our kind of skeletal phospholipid. Okay. How many ester bonds do you see there? Because phospholipases are esterases, and you said correctly that they're ester bonds. So how many ester bonds do you see there? Three, three. Anybody sees another number? Four? Okay, there are four ester bonds. One, two, three, four. Okay, these are also ester bonds with phosphoric acid. So we have four different ester bonds there, and for each of them, we have a phospholipase. Okay, so there are specific phospholipases that will only break some of these bonds. Now, you've already heard about at least one phospholipase in this signaling course. Which one was it? Phospholipase C. Now, which of those four ester bonds is hydrolyzed by phospholipase C? Now, I will give you numbers, and you can just raise your hand if you think that's the one, okay? So phospholipase C, which ester bond does it hydrolyze? Number one? Nobody thinks number one, okay. Number two? No. Number three? Okay. Number four? Good, it's always good to have more options. Uh, it's number three, okay? Can somebody explain how, we, how you figure it out? Oh, okay, okay. So one one way to figure it out is to say C is is the third letter, so it's going to be number three. Good one. Excellent. Okay. So using this heuristic like C three, okay, that's probably can be very useful in tests. Okay. But this is the good explanation. So phospholipase C will take phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate and will form diacylglycerol and IP3. So that means that this phosphate group has to go with the inositol, so it has to be this bond which is broken. Because if we, bre if we broke this bond, the phosphate group would remain with this, with this thing, and the, what, what would be the molecule called if the phosphate stayed with the rest of the phospholipid? It would be phosphatidic acid, right? So phospholipase C hydrolyzes really this bond and produces diacylglycerol and IP3 from phosphatidyl bisphosphate. Phospholipase D, so your heuristic was absolutely right. Okay, so phospholipase D is really the fourth one. Okay, this, this, is, this would be the number four. Um, so if we use phospholipase D on phosphatidyl bisphosphate, what would be the product? If we used phospholipase D on phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, what would be the product? Phosphatidic acid? And? What? <laughs> no? Once again, we have this phospholipid. We use phospholipase D to break this bond. So we get phosphatidic acid, absolutely correct. And the remaining thing is? IP2. It's going to be IP2, inositol bisphosphate. Yeah, so you, you, you basically, with phospholipase D, you only get this. With phospholipase C, you get the additional phosphate, and that's why you get inositol 
trisphosphate because this phosphate goes with the with the uh, with the inositol. Okay, now of course, for releasing arachidonic acid, we don't really care about phospholipase C and D, which are important in signaling. What we actually need is one of these two phospholipases, and in fact, it is this position where these polyunsaturated acids typically reside. Okay, so in a typical membrane phospholipid, the first position. Will be, uh, will be occupied with a saturated fatty acid, and the second position is going to be with an unsaturated or polyunsaturated fatty acid. So what we want is to actually release this specific fatty acid, and the enzyme that does it is called phospholipase A2. And this one will be called phospholipase A1. If you are looking for phospholipase B, it doesn't seem to exist. It probably was a mixture of phospholipase A1 and A2. So they called it phospholipase B, but now we know that it's actually, that there are two different, two distinct enzymes, and one hydrolyzes this one, and the other one hydrolyzes specifically this one. So in order to release arachidonic acid, we first have to activate phospholipase A2 in the cell, which is usually done by increasing calcium concentration, as is a common second messenger. So calcium increases, phospholipase A2 is activated, it is located on the membrane, and it will start digesting, releasing these polyunsaturated fatty acids from the second position. Okay? Good. Sorry, yeah. Can you use the inositol as an example, or is that like a common structure found in the molecule? Well, I used it as an example. So it could be phosphatylcholine, for example, or phosphatylserine. It's going to work the same way. Okay? I use inositol because that's something that you've seen before with phospholipase C, uh, but of course there could be other structures there. Yeah. Good. So this was the preparation for the synthesis of eicosanoids. Let's now have a look at the actual eicosanoids. And as I said, there are many of them. So I will just give you the broad classes of them and not individual molecules because yeah, there are just way, way, way too many. So eicosanoids are synthesized, broadly speaking, in two major pathways. The first pathway is called cyclizing, sometimes cyclical, but it's not really cyclical because it doesn't go in and around. So I will call it cyclizing. And it's called that because there is a cycle formed in the molecule. So it forms a cycle in the molecule. And the other one, is called linear because it doesn't form any cycles. So two broad pathways. The cyclizing pathway starts with enzymes called cyclooxygenases. Cox. Cyclooxygenase which basically just says it's an oxygenase, it, it uses molecular oxygen, and it makes a cycle. So cyclooxygenases start the cyclizing pathway, which then produces two main groups of eicosanoids. Prostaglandins and thromboxanes. Do you want me to spell it out or? Okay. Prostaglandins and thromboxanes. Thromboxanes. Now, these are not synthesized generally directly through cyclooxygenases. I will tell you in a second what, what it is. So, there are other enzymes which then take the product of cyclooxygenase and turn them into several different, many, many, many different prostaglandins and thromboxanes. Okay? The, the first product of cyclooxygenase is called prostaglandin H. There is an intermediate called prostaglandin G. So if you start looking, like digging into it, you will see the first a prostaglandin G is produced in the prostaglandin H. But I will just say that the first one is called prostaglandin H which then is converted to all other prostaglandins and to all other thromboxanes. Okay, the cyclooxygenase will make prostaglandin G, 
and then other enzymes will make all the other ones. This is the reason why the systematic name for cyclooxygenases is actually prostaglandin endoperoxide H synthase. I'll just put it in brackets, it's not necessary to know that, but just, yeah, it's called prostaglandin endoperoxide H synthase, or prostaglandin H synthase. Okay, same thing. In all the literature, you will always find them as cyclooxygenases, okay? But the correct name is prostaglandin peroxide H synthase. So prostaglandin H is the first product and will get then turned to all the other ones. Now, if at any point, well, actually, you will probably come across with prostaglandins later on because some of them are used pharmacologically, and I will mention a little bit what, what possible uses in medicine these prostaglandins have. And if you start digging deeper, you will find out that we have many different prostaglandins and there is a nomenclature of them. And I will just give you a brief introduction to the nomenclature, not so that you can know all of them, but so that you can understand how the nomenclature works. So usually after the PG for prostaglandins, there is another letter, okay? Like here is prostaglandin H, there could be prostaglandin A, prostaglandin F, prostaglandin E, all sorts of them. Now this letter tells you not you and not me, but people who understand the chemistry of prostaglandins, tells them about what kind of structural things are in the prostaglandin, okay? Because in the, both in the synthesis of P PGH and then in the other steps, there are some rearrangements in the molecule, okay? And the specific rearrangement tells you, okay, this is prostaglandin A or this is prostaglandin E or this is prostaglandin F, okay? So there's a letter. After the letter, there is always a number, like prostaglandin A2. The number tells you how many double bonds are there in the molecule. Now, that on its own might seem like, why do I care, okay? And you would be right in a way, you know, who cares how many double bonds are there? The important thing or the interesting thing is that from this number, you can actually find out what was the starting molecule for the synthesis of this prostaglandin. So all prostaglandins, which start from arachidonic acid, will have the number two. Why? Because we start with four double bonds, two double bonds are lost in the synthesis, and we are left with two double bonds. So all the prostaglandins with number two start with arachidonic acid. We also have prostaglandins of the class one, so they only have one double bond, now, which fatty acid that we talked about could we start with to remain just with one fatty acid? Keep going. They must have 20 carbons, otherwise it's not gonna work. Dihomo gamma linolenic acid, okay? Dihomo gamma linolenic acid already has 20 carbons, so it can, it can undergo all these reactions, but since it only has three double bonds, once we get rid of two of them, we are left with one. So all the prostaglandins of the, of the class one are going to be from dihomogamalinolenic acid. We also have, so this would be from arachidonic acid, this would be from dihomogamalinolenic acid, and we also have class three, which are derived from an acid that I haven't yet mentioned, but I will talk about it later on uh, because it's commonly used for supplementation, stuff like that, which is called eicosipentaenoic acid, or EPA. So we had arachidonic acid, which was eicosatetraenoic acid, and this is eicosapentaenoic acid. It's five double bonds. If we get rid of two, we remain we, we are left with three, right? That makes sense. Now, EPA is a fatty acid from the omega-3 or N3 group. So we can't make EPA by this synthesis that we looked at, okay? We can't do it because it's a different class, but we can synthesize it, for example, from alpha linolenic acid. Okay, I'm not gonna show you the synthesis. It do, it's not very efficient in our body. We don't really synthesize these molecules very well, okay, but it's technically possible. Um, so this is generally a fatty acid which is only, uh, which is only received in the diet, okay? We can't, we don't really synthesize a lot of it. Now, why am I showing you all this? The important thing is that both the 
letter variations and the number variations cause different effects of these prostaglandins. So prostaglandins with different letters will have different effects because they have different receptors. I'll mention in a second what receptors we have. But also these numbers give you different effects, different affinities to receptors and different effects on the, on the, uh, on the target tissues. And this is the reason why supplementation with some of these acids is suggested, let's put it that way, as potentially therapeutic or preventative. And I will talk about it a little bit more if this works or doesn't work. Okay, but this is just to explain why am I telling you about these subclasses? What, what are different, yeah, different effects on the yeah different affinities to receptors and di different uh, yeah effects on the target tissues. Basically, the same nomenclature is for thromboxanes. Okay, so we can have thromboxane A two, thromboxane A one, etc. So I'm not going to go through that because it's very similar. Good. So that was the cyclizing pathway, and now we have the linear pathway. The linear pathway is initiated by enzymes called lipooxygenases. So we have cyclooxygenases, and these are called lipooxygenases. The main two classes of prostaglandins, which are synthesized by lipooxygenases, we have three different lipooxygenases, but the main classes that end up being synthesized in the end are leukotrienes leukotrienes here you can see that we have three double bonds they're called leukotrienes three double bonds right and lipoxins lipoxins Now, similar to the cyclizing pathway, where I said that cyclooxygenases make prostaglandin H, from which all the other molecules are synthesized by other enzymes, it's similar for lipooxygenases. So the lipooxygenases make the first product, which is called hydroperoxy eicosatetraenoic acid. So eicosatetraenoic acid is arachidonic acid, yeah? And we just add hydroperoxy because it's basically just a, a peroxide that is formed from it. So hydroperoxy eicosa tetraenoic acid. Yeah, actually, I think it's usually written with E. So hydroperoxy eicosa tetraenoic acid. There are some different isomers. You don't need to really know that. But this is the first step. And from that, we make all the leukotrienes and all the lipoxins by using other enzymes. OK, so it's kind of symmetrical, these things. There is nomenclature of leukotrienes similar to prostaglandins and thromboxanes. I'm not going to go into details because it's a bit different. It works differently. But basically, we can have leukotriene E4, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? I'm not going to go there because it, it is, the logic is a little bit different than, uh, than previously. But just be aware that we get many different leukotrienes and different lipoxins. All right. Um, any questions about the, the synthesis and the classes of prostaglandins? Good. So we're going to take a short break, uh, three minutes or so, and then we'll continue with the effects of prostaglandins and all these eicosanoids, and then a little bit about the pharmacology. All right. Can we uh, carry on? Can we move on? Good. So. Uh, I promised before this short break that we'll talk about the effects of eicosanoids. And these effects are extremely varied. So just to make some, just to put some structure into it. So the leukotrienes and lipoxins, so the eicosanoids which are synthesized in the linear pathway, are almost exclusively synthesized by immune cells. So leukotrienes and lipoxins almost exclusively synthesized by immune cells, which contain lipooxygenases. And their effects are mainly in either stimulating inflammation or inhibiting inflammation. So they do both things, okay? Different subtypes will, some of them will be pro-inflammatory and other ones will be anti-inflammatory. And even there are some subclasses of these, of the products of lipooxygenases, 
which are important for resolving the inflammation. So they will not be causing the inflammation or inhibiting it, but after it has run its course, they are there to stimulate the repair of the tissue. Okay? So many of these linear eicosanoids will either be pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, or will help with the healing after the inflammation. Okay? I will not go into many more details. Okay? I will just say one thing that leukotrienes, some leukotrienes, have been shown to be important in some subtypes of asthma. Not all of them, okay, but some subtypes of asthma can be elicited, can be evoked by leukotrienes, and there, there are also some medications which block the action of leukotrienes on the receptors to block this type of inflammation. Now, so, yeah, lots of different ones, but mostly related to inflammation either way. With prostaglandins, it's quite a bit different because prostaglandins can be synthesized by many different types of cells in the body and their actions are in many different contexts. So only very small part of all the different actions of prostaglandins are related to inflammation. It's true, infl uh, prostaglandins can, they are actually behind a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the symptoms, a lot of the signs of inflammation like vasodilation, and vasodilation will cause swelling, redness, increased heat, yeah, because there's more blood flowing. Yeah. Prostaglandins are also responsible for causing fever. So even though they are not the, the, the first mediator, the first, medi first mediator of fever, of there's something wrong, we need to increase body temperature, are actually interleukins, interleukin-1 especially. But what happens then is that this interleukin-1 or interleukin-8 go into the brain, to the hypothalamus, and they, they, initiate, they initiate the production of prostaglandins. And it's the prostaglandins that change the setting of the thermostat in the brain. Okay? So prostaglandins are really responsible for many signs of inflammation. They, um, they are mostly pro-inflammatory. Okay? But as I said, that's only a small, small part of all their functions. So another very important function of, of prostaglandins is, and that's relevant for clinical medicine, as we'll see later on, is the regulation, the stimulation of mucus production in the stomach. So as you know, the stomach produces gastric juice, which is very aggressive, very low pH, many digestive enzymes. And of course, we have to protect the epithelium from these juices. And this is done by a layer of mucus, and the synthesis, the formation of this mucus is stimulated by prostaglandins. We take them away, if you block the action of prostaglandins, there's gonna be a problem in the stomach. And it is, as we'll see towards the end of the lecture, one of the, main, uh, uh, one of the main unwanted effects of some of the medications that we use to, to prevent the synthesis of prostaglandins, okay? So stimulation of mucus production in, in, the, in, the, in the stomach is a very important function. Prostaglandins also regulate quite widely throughout the body regulate the contraction of smooth muscles. So many smooth muscles will have receptors for prostaglandins, and the action of prostaglandins can cause vasoconstriction or vasodilation, depending on what's, what they are. One such place where this regulation of smooth muscle tone is very important are the kidneys, where in the glomeruli, which is the place where blood is filtered into the kidney, yeah, these, these blood vessel glomeruli. Um, the blood flow in the glomeruli is at least in part regulated by prostaglandins. So again, once we start interfering with prostaglandins, we might have problems with kidney function. Another such place where smooth muscle contraction and vasodilation um, is regulated at least in part uh, in, uh, by prostaglandins is erection. So a lot of treatments for sexual dysfunction in men uh, at least some of them are based on prostaglandins, on giving more prostaglandins so that, uh, so that there's vasoconstriction and erection. For women, the main, very important, even clinically important effect of prostaglandins is the contraction of uterine muscles, both in childbirth or in abortion. So abortion pills, at least some of them, not all of them, are also based on prostaglandins because they cause contraction of the uterine muscle and the, um, uh, the expulsion of the embryo or of the fetus. But the same thing is even in natural childbirth, okay? So their prostaglandins are super important and can be used to regulate the normal childbirth 
uh, labor process, basically. Um, prostaglandins are also important for regulating intraocular pressure. Okay? You know, there are fluids in the, uh, uh, in the eye, and the fluids are continuously produced and resorbed, and we have to regulate the, uh, the pressure of liquid there. If it increases too much, there's a condition, it will cause a condition called glaucoma. glaucoma. Yeah? And uh, yeah, so there are some medications that can, that can also interfere, which are based on prostaglandins. Okay? So prostaglandins, sorry, question? Yeah. Um, so prostaglandins have a really extremely broad range of effects. Once we start interfering them, we have to, we have to be aware of all these other places which will be interfered with as well. Okay? And again, we'll cover it a little bit more towards the end of the lecture when we talk about some of the medications. Now, yes? So, in inflammation, usually that is vasodilation. Yeah. Infection. Yeah. So, how, because you said uh, that they cause infection. Yeah. Stimulation. Yeah. So, we have for prostaglandins, there are more than 10 different receptors. Okay. Um, so, different receptors will have different effects, different signaling cascades, etc. Okay. So, that's the reason. And that's also the reason why we have so many different prostaglandins, because they will be binding to different receptors causing different things, okay? So, at this point, well, generally, I think in, in, in medical school, you will not learn about individual prostaglandins and their individual receptors, because there are just so many of them, okay? So, we're just putting them all in, into, into one bag, but in reality, you know, prostaglandin E will have a different effect because it binds to prostaglandin E receptors than prostaglandin F, which binds to prostaglandin F receptors and causes different signaling pathways. So that's the reason why we can have both. You know, in some in, in some situations we can vasodilation, in others it can be uh, there could be vasoconstriction. The last group I haven't really talked about are thromboxanes, and thromboxanes their main function is. Um, to regulate the aggregation of platelets. So they're produced mainly in the platelets, in the, in the blood, um, and they activate the aggregation of platelets in when there's damage to the blood vessel, and basically it's the beginning of, the, of stopping of bleeding, right? So thromboxanes have this very specific function, aggregation and adhesion of platelets, uh, and we'll see towards the end of the lecture how we can interfere with this to prevent some cardiovascular diseases. So pretty specific function for thromboxanes. All right, so those were the effects. Are there any questions, any further questions about the effects? Yeah? If there's so many different prostaglandins, why don't they just do the same thing as neurotransmitters and have one molecule for many different kinds of receptors? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how it is. I, I don't know. It, it would be a lot easier because the structures of prostaglandins are absolutely insane and distinguishing between them is horrible. I don't know how why it developed. But interestingly, prostaglandins are very old signaling molecules from an evolutionary perspective. So yeah, maybe there were some reasons for that. I don't know. Yeah, it, it would make sense, I guess. But yeah. um, I mean, wh what you get by having different prostaglandins is that you can also, so it's, you needn't just vary the effect based on receptors, but you can also have also different tissues producing different prostaglandins, if you know what I mean. So you can have like two different, vari there can be an, a variation on the effect on the receptor side and then on the production side because you can be producing different ones. So I guess that might be an advantage because you get a bigger, bigger number of combinations, so let's put it that way. But I, I don't know, honestly, I don't know. All right. Let's now get to the last part of the lecture, and let's talk a little bit about the pharmacology of eicosanoids. So, how can we how can we interfere with the um, with their metabolism, with their effect, mainly to reduce inflammation? So, before we get to the actual pills that people take, um, let's talk a little bit about supplementation with polyunsaturated fatty acids, because that's something that many of you probably have heard about, or maybe even take some fish oil supplements or something like that. So, I think it's worth talking a little, a little bit about that. The whole idea about supplementing, especially fish oils, now, fish oils generally are high in EPA, that's the omega 3 acid that I, that I talked about, or N3 acid, and also in its sibling called DHA, which stands for tocosahexaenoic acid. Tocosa meaning 22. So it has 22, 6, and 3. Yeah, 
toco sa hexa inoic acid. Uh, so fish oils are generally high in those two uh, in, in those two fatty acids, and the idea about supplementation with these fatty acids is that if you eat enough of them, they will supplant, they will exchange for the arachidonic acid, which normally is the main uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in our phospholipids. So there will be a high proportion of EPA and DHA in our membrane phospholipids. And when these fatty acids are released by which enzyme? When they are released from the phospholipids? Yeah, but specifically? No. No. A1. A A <laughs> okay, now you said all of that. A2, phospholipase A2 is the one which releases them from the second position. So when that happens, when phospholipase A2 is, is, is activated, these fatty acids will be released instead of arachidonic acid, and we will get a production of these other classes of prostanoids or prostaglandins, so not the prostaglandin 2, but the ones with three double bonds, and these have different affinities and different effects on those receptors. So the idea is maybe we can decrease inflammation by giving these because some of these prostaglandins are less active when they are in the three class than they are in the two class. Okay, that's the idea behind it. Does it make sense? So basically we, we start making prostaglandin, different prostaglandins, okay? The ones from arachidonic acids are, for example, PGE2, from EPA, it's going to be PGE3, and that will have different affinities to receptors and different effects. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, the evidence for the effect of these supplements is very unclear. So, so far, even though many, many studies have been done, so far there's no clear evidence that it actually works. Now, there may be several reasons for that. One reason is that many of the supplements that were studied have non-standardized amounts of these, photo, of these fatty acids. So they will give them fish oils, but they, they don't know how much of these fatty acids are there. So there's going to be a huge variation. And that's why in those studies, they don't really see very good effects because, yeah, it's a bit random. There's a lot of random noise because of that. So that's part of the reason. The other part of the reason probably is that these two fatty acids, EPA and DHA, have different effects. So if you use them in a mixture, the effects might be actually masking each other, and you might actually not see the proper effect. So recently, there were some, some studies using just pure EPA or pure DHA and their mixture, and there were some promising results. Maybe it's doing something. Maybe it's protecting, for example, uh, people from cardiovascular events like myocardial infarction. Loads of studies. It's still being studied. So far, the evidence is weak. Um, so we can't, at this point, we can't really say that using, supplementing with these fatty acids and with, with fish oils is doing something good. We can't really say that. So maybe, maybe in the future there will be better studies, but yeah, I mean, when you read the papers about this, you see how extremely complicated it is to study this because some people may, might be taking some cholesterol lowering medication, which may interfere with the effect and it's just incredibly complicated. So currently using these supplements is probably not a very effective anti-inflammatory or cardiovascular risk decreasing treatment. Fortunately, we have really effective drugs that have existed for some, some of them for more than 100 years, which are actually extremely effective and we know exactly what they're doing. And the prototypical anti-inflammatory drug, which interferes with eicosanoid and especially prostaglandin synthesis, is aspirin. Now aspirin, aspirin is a brand name. It's a brand name by the company Bayer. So no one else who makes this molecule can call it aspirin. So we shouldn't really call it aspirin. We should call it by its real name, which is acetylosalicylic acid. Salicylic acid. This is the acetylo part, so it's acetylated salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is basically this phenol thing or benzoic acid with, with OH. Yeah. Salicylic acid is, has, was used 
from time immemorial in folk medicine because it is in various tree barks and whatever. So it was used as a as an inflammatory anti-inflammatory uh, medication for yeah from time immemorial. But this specific molecule was synthesized sometime in mid 19th century and has been used since as a very very effective anti-inflammatory drug. Now, of course, it was only found out much, much, much later, I think in 1960s or 70s, that this molecule is a very potent inhibitor of cyclooxygenases. So it's a COX inhibitor. And what is super interesting is that it's actually an irreversible COX inhibitor. How does it work? Well, this whole molecule goes into the active side of the enzyme, and the acetyl group binds covalently to the active site and basically kills the enzyme forever. This makes acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin makes a very special anti-inflammatory drug. All the other ones that we'll talk about are reversible, so they can be removed from the enzyme and the enzyme can start working again. Not so with aspirin. And this is the reason why acetyl salicylic acid is used in one very specific, so you all know that Aspirin can be used for headaches or decreasing inflammation or decreasing pain and all these things, which work through COX inhibition. But it is also used in a very special indication, very special use, which is preventing myocardial infarction. There, it is used in very low doses. So people take, every day they would take 60 milligrams, something like a much lower dose than is the, the dose you would take for a headache, which is usually 500 milligrams. So you're taking a tenth of the normal, normal dose. And the reason why it works even at such very, very low concentrations is that it is an irreversible inhibitor. Because basically what we do with this low dose aspirin is that we obviously block cyclooxygenases forever, we kill them, in all the cells that contain cyclooxygenases. But in most cells, immediately new cyclooxygenase is made, and therefore the inhibition with this very low dose is only very short acting. However, in platelets, which do not have cell nucleus because they're just fragments of cells, they can't make new cyclooxygenase. So in platelets, this inhibition of cyclooxygenase actually lasts for the whole life, even with this very, very tiny dose. So what we get with this tiny dose of aspirin is complete block of synthesis of, in this case, thromboxanes, because that's what platelets produce. So we block the synthesis of thromboxanes. They can't make thromboxanes, which, as you'll recall, are the eicosanoids which make them aggregate, which make them adhere and aggregate and, and basically start forming, forming blood clots. Okay? So you block that. But for all the other tissues, which just easily make new cyclooxygenase, you don't get any side effects, okay? So you will not cause GI bleeding or something like that. And also, which is probably complicating the story a bit more, the endothelium where the, where the platelets would normally adhere to and make blood clots, it produces prostaglandin I2, which is called prostacycline, which actually normally inhibits the aggregation of platelets. So the platelets, you kill off the production of thromboxanes, so they, they're not going to activate their, their clotting or their aggregation. You will, for a very short period of time, also block the, the, the production of prostacycline, which is normally anti-aggregation. But since the endothelial cells have their nuclei functioning, they will make new cyclooxygenase, and basically in a short period of time, they will start producing this anti-aggregation prostacycline, this PGI2. So what we do by this low-dose low dose aspirin is we tilt the balance between prostaglandin I2, which is anti-aggregation, and thromboxane A2, which is pro-aggregation. We tilt it in such a way that there will be basically almost no, t no thromboxane, and still normal amount of prostacycline. And that's why it works so well. It would not work with low dose. I will mention a few other similar drugs, which are also COX inhibitors. It would not work with them because they're not irreversible. Does it make sense why aspirin, why acetyl salicylic acid is so useful with the, for this low dose? Yeah, okay, it's a pretty interesting, I think it's quite an interesting mechanism. All right, so that's acetyl salicylic acid and it is a non-specific COX inhibitor, so it will inhibit all the subtypes of cyclooxygenase. 
there are in fact two subtypes, cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. Cyclooxygenase 2 is the enzyme which is upregulated in inflammation. So it's not there, it's not in the tissues most of the time. It is there when there's inflammation. It will be upregulated, okay, and start producing prostaglandins. COX-1 is this housekeeping en enzyme, this enzyme which is present in the cells all the time and which is responsible for all these regulation of blood flow in the kidneys and intraocular pressure and all these other things, pr protection of, of the gastric mucosa, etc. So aspirin will block both of them. It will not differentiate between them. It's nonspecific. Okay? Another similar molecule, I will draw the structure, but of course you don't need to know the structure. This is just to show you how similar these molecules are. Um, another such COX inhibitor, again, nonspecific, looks like this. And this is even more commonly used, probably, um, painkiller especially, which is ibuprofen. Ibuprofen. Now you see that the structure is somewhat similar, but there is no acetyl group which would bind covalently to the enzyme. So this is a competitive, a reversible inhibitor of cyclooxygenases. Again, non-selective. It will bind both to COX-1 and COX-2 and block them, but it is reversible. So once it is removed from the body, the cyclooxygenases are working again. This obviously has some advantages, but it has also disadvantages because yeah, you have to keep giving for anti-inflammatory effects. You have to keep give, giving ibuprofen and again, uh, again and again. Uh, yeah, I usually say that you can you can kind of see in the name the structure because in the old times when they called when they named these molecules they tried to put the structure in it. Okay, so this ibu is this isobutyl. Okay, this pro is the propionic acid. Okay, and phen, yeah, phenol, ben benzyl, ben benzene ring. Okay, so ibuprofen. Nowadays, with modern with modern chemicals, you can't do that. They're just random. Yeah, but here you can kind of see the the structure. The last one I would just mention, which is quite closely related, even chemically closely related, but for a long time it was unknown how it worked. And, and it's another drug which is used for these purposes quite often, is paracetamol. Now paracetamol will look quite a lot like aspirin. But, as I said, for until very recently, it was unknown how paracetamol worked, which is quite amazing because it's probably one of the most prescribed and one of the most taken drug in the world. And until recently, nobody knew how it worked. There were many, many theories, and if I showed you my lectures from previous many years, I would, every year I would just say, oh, there's a new hypothesis how it works. Nowadays, it looks like paracetamol is also a COX inhibitor it's also a COX inhibitor but it's a very strange kind of COX inhibitor because it only inhibits the enzyme in very specific conditions depending on the concentration of arachidonic acid and whatever it's a very very strange inhibitor okay so it will work in a similar way but the details of its mechanism of effect are still a little bit unclear what is important for clinical use Paracetamol is never used as an anti-inflammatory agent. So paracetamol will be used for pain, for fever, but not for inflammation, for treating inflammation. Okay, it's, it's, it's not effective for that, for whatever reason, okay? These two can be very, very effective anti-inflammatory agents. Often they have to be given in much larger doses than you would give for a headache or a fever, okay? So as, as, as anti-inflammatory agents, you have to ramp up the dose quite a bit. Yes. Okay. Yeah. While paracetamol, the effects are complex. 
Yeah, it, it will decrease pain, actually in some ways more effective than ibuprofen, for example, in, in some types of pain, but the mechanism is complicated there. Yeah. Both of them considered NSAIDs and paracetamol is not considered at all. Correct. So these two molecules and many other would be clinically put in a group of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Paracetamol, because it does not have anti-inflammatory properties, is not an NSAID. Even though, again, the structures are very similar, the mechanism is probably quite similar, but clinically it's not an NSAID. It doesn't have anti-inflammatory properties. So, I said that we have two classes of enzymes, and obviously once this was known, the obvious idea was, okay, let's make COX-2 specific inhibitors because then we'll not have all the side effects, all the bad effects, because we are inhibiting the good enzyme. And let's just inhibit the bad enzyme, the one that is involved in inflammation. And this is something that was really done in, I think, first time in the 1990s. And the drugs which are COX-2 specific inhibitors are called, you will recognize them because they end with COXIB. They're called COXIBs, which stands for COX inhibitor, okay, COXIBs. Now, they are used in clinical medicine. They can be quite effective, especially the newer generations. They do tend to have fewer of the, of the typical side effects of these NSAIDs. So the, the most important side effect of taking aspirin, ibuprofen, and all these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is bleeding into the GIT, into the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, that's, that's the most threatening and the most common side effect, and people have to be careful about, not, yeah, about preventing that. So coxibs do not really have these many side effects, but some of them have a strange side effect, kind of counterintuitive side effect, because they actually increase blood clotting. They increase the aggregation of platelets. And the first coxib, I see your question, but just one second. The first coxib, which is called Rafa coxib, and I think it was produced by Merck or Pfizer, not, not sure about that now, um, had to be actually withdrawn from the market because many people died of heart attacks and strokes after taking this Rafa coxib. Uh, the company, I can't remember which one it was, uh, had to pay like billions of dollars to the people, to, to the families who died. And then it was found that the company actually knew about the side effect. They knew in clinical trials, they already knew it was happening, but they still started marketing it because they thought it would go away or it would not be a big problem. It was a big problem, and that's why rofacoxib was removed from the market and is not available anymore. But many of the coxibs still have a warning on them saying, be careful, because in some patients, they can increase the risk of these cardiovascular disorders. I will not go into details why that is so. Basically, it's a balance between COX-1 and COX-2, which is which is kind of put into imbalance and can cause these, these strange reactions. You had a question. And the side effect is relating to the locus? Correct, yeah. The main side effect of NSAIDs, which is GIT bleeding, is caused by this inhibition of production of mucus and therefore, yeah, the, the aggression of it gastric juice. Like, uh, gastric ulcers? Yeah, it, it can cause gastric ulcers, absolutely, yeah. A, a relatively common thing, especially for people who are taking high doses of these anti-inflammatory drugs. All right, we had non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which kind of tells you that there must also be steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And these are called glucocorticoids. So you know that glucocorticoids are normal hormones of the adrenal cortex. The most common one in our body is cortisol. And glucocorticoids have extremely powerful anti-inflammatory effects. Of course, they also have all the other effects, but they have anti-inflammatory effect. And the main mechanism through which they cause their anti-inflammatory effect is, uh, what is the signaling cascade for glucocorticoids? What, they, what do they do? What kind of receptors they have? Intracellular. Intracellular receptors. And after they're activated, they translocate into the nucleus and they influence uh, gene expression. One of the genes which is stimulated by glucocorticoids 
or genes, there are several of them, are for proteins called uh, lipocortins. And these are proteins which bind to phospholipase A2 and block its activity. So lipocortins will block the activity of PLA2. And if you block the activity of PL PLA2, phospholipase A2, you will not get any arachidonic or EPA or whatever, any of these acids. Therefore, you will not produce any of the eicosanoids. And this decreases inflammation. Notice that glucocorticoids will block both of the pathways, both the cyclizing pathway and linear pathway, because you don't have any starting substrate, you can't make any of them. Yeah? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs will only block the Cox pathway, but they will not block the linear pathway. This is also part of the reason, it is a reason why in some patients giving non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can actually cause asthma. Why? Because we block cyclooxygenase, which means that more arachidonic acid is left for the linear pathway, which produces leukotrienes, which can cause asthma. Okay? So it's relatively rare, but something to be aware that some people with asthma may have a problem with, with NSAIDs by this strange mechanism. Glucocorticoids, we currently don't use cortisol for anti-inflammatory purposes. There are now newer derivatives of glucocorticoids, which are thousands, th thousand times more effective uh, than cortisol. And some of you may be using these sprays for allergies or something, and many of them contain these super highly effective glucocorticoids. Okay, so uh, that's something that you may have come across, and you will see glucocorticoids almost everywhere in dermatology, yeah, all sorts of places, because they're extremely effective. But they also have potentially fatal or very severe side effects uh, because they will obviously influence, they all have all the other glucocorticoid effects as, as cortisol does, only a thousand times higher. So you have to be very careful, careful with these drugs, especially when you are withdrawing them. So people taking high doses of glucocorticoids have to be weaned of them very slowly because as they are taking these high doses of glucocorticoids, their hypothesis, their pituitary gland, will start, will stop producing ACTH, which is the normal hormone which stimulates the production of glucocorticoids, and the adrenal co cortex becomes smaller because it's not being stimulated by ACTH. So when you withdraw the glucocorticoids very sharply, the patients will have not enough glucocorticoids and they can even die in some situations, very dangerous situations. So you have to be careful when withdrawing glucocorticoids. Last thing I'll say, for very severe inflammation, and especially systemic inflammation, like in autoimmune diseases, we can also use immunosuppressant agents. So not anti-inflammatory, which are just in interfering with the signaling, but we can actually use medications that bring down the activity of the whole immune system uh, so that the immune system is not attacking the, the body. So we can use immunosuppressants, and I will just mention one of them, pretty old, but still used in some situations, which is called cyclosporin A. So that's a, an immunosuppressant, which is mostly used or used to be used, but still can be used in some situations for uh, organ transplant patients. So in, after organ transplant, you have to suppress the immune system so that it doesn't destroy the, uh, the graft, the new organ. So cyclosporin A and newer, newer formulations of this are used, but we can also use it for some very severe inflammations uh, as well. All right, any questions? No? All right, that's it.